Welcome to the God is not an asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your hosts, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. Listen, everybody, today we're talking to Veronica Caspaneda, who is a neurodivergent indigenous woman who doesn't fit in anywhere but belongs everywhere. Veronica, you and I had a had a conversation uh, several days ago. You recommended uh, last week, you recommended uh, La India Maria, you know, th- that series of movies. And I actually pulled one up on, I think, YouTube or something and watched one. Uh, the title is Nidia Aki, Nidia Ya. Can you just kind of place uh, that character in, in, in culture and in your life, in your heart? So La India Maria, for me, she's, she's uh, my alias, I guess you could call it. Um, my family from my Mexican side, uh, including some people that I know, they always told me that and they do it. They, here's the thing about Mexican humor. It's very, it's very dark. And so we need to find humor even in our pain. And so this is what India Maria came about from Mexico. It, that everybody was making fun of, you know, the indigenous people of Mexico and the colonization. But uh, Maria Elena, who was an actress and the, and the, the producer of the, of the story, made it in a comical way where she says, see, yeah. even with all your intelligence, you're stupid. And look at me, wow. I'm the indigenous, the least of these, and yet I'm outsmarting you. In all the movies, she does it. And so to me, she's a character that that I find almost gave me that that affirmation of like, it's okay if you're awkward. Mm-hmm. It's okay if not everybody gets you. Your tribe will find you. Mm-hmm. So that belonging comes well, eventually. It's also very entertaining. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, and I might, I have to add that, that with everything that, that you know, that a clinician goes through, uh, humor is my go-to, you know, it releases all those good, you know, uh, narrow stuff that we need in our brains. So humor, definitely humor. I love her first uh, flight. You know, she's leaving Mexico to come to the U.S. and she's on a plane and she's scared out of her wits. <laughs> And she's grabbing the guy sitting next to her, whose girlfriend is on the other side of him. And she's <laughs> she's kind of suspicious. Why is she, you know? And then the next scene, you see that she's sitting next to the girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> That's where my narrow divergent humor is, because sometimes I don't know the social rules or social cues. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, I hope they understand that it's not coming from whatever it is that they're thinking. Right. right. Yeah. So uh, tell us, tell us how you became a teacher while you were a student at Fuller Seminary. A teacher in what, in what sense? Just a teacher of of reality of, of your life. Um, I, I guess I don't consider, and, and I, and I mean this very sincerely, I don't consider myself a teacher. I consider myself. And like I said earlier, with with that whole bilingual experience, I'm interp- I'm an interpreter of life. Um, there you go. That's it. And so um, I've always, when God gave me the gift, or, or I guess the blessing of being a a clinician, is it that's most of the work is interpreting the the struggle of the person, and to be able to then give back. Um, you know, that, that healing, uh, what Native Americans call, um, 
I guess in my language, a medicine woman. I bring the medicine of healing. I, I bring the medicine of Jesus Christ. I bring the medicine of grace, of, of everything that God get, gives us. How do you how do you experience the divine feminine? I, I, that was one of the things that was really powerful when you were speaking about bathing your niece, and I was I was just taken by very um it just made me think of the divine feminine that that nurturing that that caring and that beautiful work of of bathing and so i'm curious and i know that as a you know a fellow, fellow seminary student as well you know um the learning just how hidden the divine feminine is in scripture and yet she's not she's all over it but we just have not been um been allowed to recognize her presence there. So I'm curious about how you experience the divine feminine in your practice in your life. Yes. What comes to mind as I hear you, Carrie, is I have a roommate who is from Spain. Mm -hmm. And so he said, he told me, you know what? The Mexican people are very suffer are, are sufferers. They're very suffering. They suffer a lot mm -hmm. and they do it on purpose. I believe the divine feminine is just that, mm -hmm. is turning the suffering into meaning. meaning but a woman who gives birth knows what that's like yeah. i'm not a mom mm -hmm. but i've seen it mm -hmm. uh, i'm nurturing to my n n nephew and my niece and i know that i have to be suffering as i give on life in other aspects that is that that is an act of sacrifice Right. I believe that's, okay. that's what it is. Thank you. So the image that came up for me, and, and maybe you can break this down a bit, but um, <laughs> several years ago, at least, I don't know, over a decade ago, my wife and I happened to be uh, in um, in Mexico during Holy Week. And we, we were astonished to see this man who crawled. He was on his knees and he crawled for maybe two miles. Um, and he was getting bloody, really, uh, to go to the church. Um, and when you, when you talked about the uh, Mexican people being sufferers, that's the first thing I thought of. Can you, can you break that down? Yes. Um, I believe, I believe this is how I understand it. It's humility. We're taught to be humble, especially those of us who have, uh, our ancestors from who work the land. We're, we're taught to be humble. And, and, and then, you know, what I've, what I've gathered too is in our language. When you speak Spanish, there is two levels. English, there's only one. It's very direct. In Spanish, there's two. And my mother instilled in us, number one, in this household, you're only going to speak Spanish. At school, you speak English. Number two, you're always going to call me usted. Usted uh, is the higher level. Right. right. You're always going to call your elders usted. And so... Right now, when you shared that, my great grandmother did that for one of my uncles uh, in the growing up in the Roman Catholic Church. She said, "You know what? If you heal my my grandson from uh, polio, I will go. I will go to the church on my knees." And she did it. So that is what is instilled in us: is the humility. Is you know what you you remain humble. <sighs> how how do you process that personally? it's a balance. It's a balance of remaining humble and knowing how to use your voice. Because I also had one uncle tell me, Veronica, you don't need to say it like that. And I said, in Spanish, and I said, Theo, if I don't say it, I don't have a husband. I don't have kids. I don't have nobody over here to say, hey, Veronica's doing this. And I'm like, if I don't tell you, I'm not doing it out of haughtiness. I'm telling you what God is doing through me. So teach me, and she teach me how to say it in a more humble way. Then don't try to, you know, the patriarchal, you know, culture that we have. Don't try to make me less. I'm doing the work, but then teach me then how not to say it in a way that sounds like I'm being arrogant. I think there's such an important dif differentiation to make, and I don't think it's made often in the church, in the institution of church, um, between humility and just complete devaluation of the, of the human being, right? I think so often we make the mistake of going toward devaluing human and that 
that manifests in in a multi- multiple ways, but very much in um, you know anti body anti embodiment, right? And um, and patriarchy and and in so, just in so many ways. So I think that when you say it's a balance, right? I would love to hear more about how you do that, how you balance your your value as um, as your true authentic self, which you know systemically has been told in multiple ways you're not enough, right? Um, with you know, and and saying no, I I deserve to be here, which is one of the things that I love about womanism, right? Because womanism says I, you matter, but so do I, right? Like so. And that's one of the things that I love about womanism. Not that I'm a womanist but, or an ex- expert in it, but that's one of the things that really spoke to me. Um, so how do you balance that with the humility that you're talking about, right? That How do you balance that? I I call in my mentors as well, the, the authors of certain books. And one of them is Maya Angelou. Mm-hmm. So I read authors such as herself who remind me that the cage bird also sings. And oh. when you read her story, when, when you read her, such women as her, that as a woman, that's where I get, I get, I got my strength. And this is something that I tell my clients as well is you need to find people who resonate with your soul because those are the ones that when struggles come, when opposition comes, those words are there that to sustain you to keep going. And I would say she is the most prominent, most, most powerful voice that I have in my life. Um, to say, I, I, read, I read her, I listen to her audiobooks, and, and, and it's like, hey, man, you can do this. Beautiful. I, you know, I, when you said, yeah. you mentioned Maya Angelou, I, kinda, I got chills because I don't know why this is and it may not be relevant to our conversation. But in the past four or five days, her name has come up at least five Mm -hmm. times in my exchanges with people, you know, just like concentrated within a few days. So that's, I mean, that's some kind of sign to me. I don't know what it is, but uh, thank you for referencing her. Yeah. Wow. You're welcome. So what else are you reading? What else do you read? Um, Right now, I'm... I'm diving back into uh, the readings of, I'm reading the book, I have it right here, Compassion by, um, why is his name escaping me right now? Um, He's a Catholic priest, very prominent, taught at Harvard, I believe. Um, Uh, Is he big on social media? No, he passed away a while ago. Oh, okay. Um, but I'm reading one of his books and that and and in his book he referenced compassion and competition. And I believe that's something that this church is struggling with right now. And that's why I believe that that the world deems us irrelevant sometimes as as a body of Christ. So I'm I'm reading his books because he he went through a lot of suffering as well. He even though he had a high status in in academics and academia. He also went uh, to Europe to serve the mentally ill. And um, again, it's it's. I think right now I I just need more of that grounding. I seek it for myself because I believe with everything going on in the world and social media that strokes our ego. Sometimes we need that grounding to understand what our real purpose is here. We're messengers of Christ. We're messengers of his grace. And, you know, the world right now is just so heightened with, and I include myself, we don't even know it, that we're just cruising along and saying like, well, it's my right, you know, and I, yes or no. I mean, right now, the most rare thing is kindness. The most rare thing is patience. And if we read the Beatitudes, man, I know we're falling short from the glory of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I, I catch myself, I, I, try to, I try to be introspective. Like I told our mutual friend, I say, he said, well, Veronica, you know, you feel like you don't belong in church. How, how do you do it? And I said, well, it was ingrained in me, the spiritual discipline since I was a little girl. Getting on my knees is what I do. Okay, so so Veronica, well, I might as well mention our mutual friend Kenichi. Um, 
So he wonders how you how you function without church. And let me I'm gonna tell you that you're 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 not uh unusual when it comes to that, but you are functioning. And w- let me ask why you don't go to church. Uh I talked to Nietzsche. I said the cynic in me comes out by uh when I hear them as a theologian. I said, oh, they didn't do their eschatology work. Oh, they didn't do their translation right. Oh, they're leaving out this this portion of people. And so I'd rather hear it. Um, also, as a introvert, it takes a lot for me to be in a, in a very big group of people. So I do take my godson. I do take him to church. But for me to say I'm going to belong to this church, let me tell you the truth. I served at a church where where I thought, okay, well, let me be behind the scenes. I'll, I'll be in the clean team. And to me, it was heartbreaking when they didn't even notice that I, that I didn't even go. And so then I thought, okay, uh, I befriended, uh, I saw my life kind of like, okay, well, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time in the synagogue. <laughs> His work was out there. So I started to befriend people who wouldn't normally go to church. I have friends who call themselves witches. I have friends who call themselves agnostics. Do they know I'm I'm a Christian? Absolutely. Or that I'm a follower of Christ. Um, And so that to me was like, okay, you know, this is where where I need to be right now, is out here. Where is this pointing us? Where... Uh, you know, there are so many people who, like you, just can't find a place in an institutional church. What is this saying to us as a society? Um, this past Sunday, when I took my godson to church, there's a pastor who's retiring in that church, and there's a new pastor. And the new pastor, he's new. So like most of us, he, you know, he he's starting. And... So I told him, oh, Sebastian, if I wanted him taking you to walk down. And he said, no, 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 you need, you, need, you need to stay for the whole message. And I said, okay, puppy. <laughs> and then I said, all right, I, you know, you're right. We, the word says that there's always God, word never returns void. You're right. And then he said, um, but I agree. He's like, I, I would zone out. It's pointing us at a church. Uh, this is where I'm getting to, uh, Dr. Moore, is I told him, here's what, what really upsets me about church nowadays. I said, let me ask you something. Is the church for the believer or the, or the unbeliever? And he said, I would think both. I said, you're right. How did that pastor preach for the believer or the unbeliever? If you were to bring your friends, do you think they would have understood the message? Would they have zoned no. out? Are we using a language that is inclusive? Are we using stories that are inclusive? Are we making God's word relevant? I said, and that to me is a problem is I don't need more, you know, not to be arrogant. I don't need more seminary in me. I need for this to be able to be translated for the unbeliever, for them to say, oh, I get it. And it wasn't our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all about storytelling. Why? Because he knew he wouldn't get it. Uh, Well, thank you for that. Um, Wow. Yeah, I you know, I think that the needs, many of the needs of church are fulfilled in a lot of spaces, as you indicated. You know, I thought of, uh, you know, gay bars as churches, as, you know, people who have historically been excluded from the institutional church, they started their own church. And a lot of people in a lot of ways um, do that. And I think that needs to be respected. Veronica, thank you for taking the time to share the wealth of who you are with us today, for being present with us, for being vulnerable with us. And I know that uh, not just Carrie and myself, but there will be uh, other people who will, you you know, who will feel more valuable as well, just because you came on to have this conversation with us. So, Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. My honor, my privilege. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. It was so nice getting to know you, Veronica. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, likewise. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance-based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805-703-8393 because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole.